Welcome back. The very animal that's a prime suspect in the spread of COVID-19 to humans may actually hold the key to protecting us from the virus. Dan Riskin investigates how the secret to surviving the disease may lie in the much maligned bat. As the primary suspects in spreading deadly coronaviruses, you might loathe bats. But the secrets the world's only flying mammals hold just might make you love them. While coronaviruses can kill humans, incredibly, bats can thrive with them in their bodies. Unlocking that secret is what brought two unlikely scientists together. She's not too upset about being in my hand right now. Both highly recognized in their fields, fields that wouldn't normally overlap. Okay, Aaron J. so we have the animal, it's almost anesthetized, and I think we'll take a hair sample first and then blood sample at the end. That's perfect, sounds good. Virus researcher Aaron J. Banerjee and bat scientist Paul Four are working towards one of the most critical goals facing humanity, protecting people from coronaviruses. Good. We'll save the sample and see if we can do some analysis on it. Okay. For the blood samples, we'll look at if there's any antibodies. That'll be very useful. Bats are key because they have a superpower many humans wish they had. Bats are known to live with coronaviruses in their bodies without negative side effects. Harnessing that for people would be a global game changer. What's mind boggling is such a tiny mammal might have an amazing immune response to some of the nastiest viruses and we can learn from it. A full suit, layers of gloves, and a powered respirator to filter contaminants from the air he breathes. And Aaron Jay is ready to battle SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Aaron Jay's already made history by helping to isolate the novel coronavirus, sending samples to research groups around the world, including the National Institutes of Health in the United States. Now, he's using tissues and blood samples from bats to explore how these animals deal with the virus so successfully. I understand why everybody on Earth is talking about bats and coronaviruses now, but you were into this before it was cool. So it's always been cool. Well, so why is it cool for you? Why were you studying bats and coronaviruses when no one else was? This is really what drives me every morning when I wake up is why do bats coexist with these viruses when humans get severely sick? Bats are mammals just like you and myself, right? So they, their immune system is very similar to the, to, the, to the human immune system. However, bats can deal with these viruses. His fascination started in 2014. West Africa was hit with the most widespread outbreak of Ebola in history, a horrific virus that causes some victims to bleed from their eyeballs. It killed more than 11,000 people. But when bats were infected, they barely even blinked. And it wasn't just this virus. Ebola virus, Marburg virus, Nipah, Hendra, coronaviruses, you experimentally infect bats or you find bats that are naturally infected, no signs of disease. But when these viruses move from bats into humans, you know what happens. It's, it's very high case fatality rates with some of these viruses. So uh, that really intrigued me. What's novel about the bat immune system? To try to find the answer, Aaron Jay came to one of the best places in the world with access to live bat samples, McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. I think you're gonna like this, Dan. There's both an It's where Paul runs one of the only captive colonies in the world of big brown bats. So we have both uh, a quarantine side, there's no animals over here right now, and this is where the established colony is. So we have about 100 bats in here. That smells like bats. Yes, it's got a very nice odor to it. And you can see we have water and food for stations for the animals. The animals are roosting behind these towels, and they also have some natural uh, wood roosts. And uh, you can see right here that there are big brown bats. Oh, hello. Look at you. Look at that. 
And you say, I mean, it looks like there are no bats in here, but you say there are 100 bats in this room? There are about 100 bats in this room. There are, there's, there's probably some behind, further behind this tell. There's some in that wooden roost, and there's also some behind the big tell. That's amazing. You've got yourself a male bat there. And then this is the outside? That's right. So there's a little passageway we've cut through the wall here. So bats have access to this larger outdoor flying area. And uh, it just gives them a room to exercise and to interact socially in a, in a larger environment. And we even hope that we have a block light. We even hope to attract a few small insects just to keep the foraging skills intact. That'd be cool if they were eating wild bugs that were coming in from outside. That would be very nice. And I see you have a very cooperative friend with you. Yeah, no, I like him. What's his name? Well, this one is uh, Yellow 142. Yellow 142. I do like you, Yellow 142. <laughs> Awesome. Since by this time you've probably noticed I'm a big fan of bats, I think it's time for full disclosure. My science background is in bat biomechanics, studying how they move. Yeah, I'm going to try to get going a little faster. For my PhD, I put vampire bats on a treadmill to show how they use their powerful wings not just for flight, but for running. Yet another extraordinary bat feed we have much more to learn about. And that curiosity has led me around the world, searching for different species to learn from. In Peru, there's this tree, the hollow bit. Let's go take a look. There are these giant, gross things. It's katydids. I guess the body's two and a half inches. And then there's bats. Does life get any better? No. In order to study bats close up, Hello. Hi. Paul breeds these big brown bats at his lab. Every year, between five and ten females give birth to twin pups. These bats seem pretty calm, eh? Yes, my little uh, gal is calm right down now. The one I have uh, is a Pink 57. Pink 57. And mine has an 84 on her wristband. It's Sky blue 84, yeah. So your bat that you're holding uh, was born in captivity this year. The blood and tissue samples Paul gets from these bats are crucial to Aaron Jay's work. So what do you hope Aaron Jay is able to figure out? What is it that is special about the immune system of bats? There have been all these different hypotheses about why bats are special, why the diseases might come from bats. And some of them have to do with their body temperature and flight. Do you, can you explain those? Because bats are flying mammals, flight is energetically expensive and it causes the animals to raise their body temperatures. And so the idea is that their, their cells, their, their general physiology has evolved to work at elevated temperatures relative to other mammals. So the elevated temperature may have in fact created a different environment for which their the pool of organisms that coexist with bats have adapted as well. And their immune system, of course, of the bats has adapted to working with these higher temperatures. Human bodies normally react to infection with a fever, raising the body temperature. But that doesn't work well for a virus that's already survived in bats. So the idea is that a disease that comes from a bat is used to high temperatures. So when a human gets it and they elevate their temperature to fight it, the disease is like, ha, I've seen this before. That's one possibility. Again, these are, these are hypotheses. They're not well explored and tested yet, but, but we're still trying to figure out different avenues of research of where to go with this work. Another possibility Aaron Jay is investigating has to do with inflammation. If we get an infection, our bodies react dramatically, but bats can somehow control that inflammation. If you pinch yourself, you see a red bump, right? So swelling, that's localized inflammation. So what some of these viruses do, like coronaviruses, for example, you get massive inflammation in your lungs. So you really drown in your own immune response. Bats don't have that. So bats have a super strong control over their inflammatory responses. They just don't have an overdrive of the inflammation that you see in humans. So when a bat gets a coronavirus, does it go to the bat's lungs the way it does for humans? So the way we've done these studies is by looking at the receptor for the virus. Now, for a virus to infect a cell, it has to dock onto your cells, and it has to clip onto its receptor to go inside the cells, right? Now, in bats, those receptors are expressed in kidneys, livers, and intestines. So for us, this is a lung disease, but for bats, this is a digestive problem? 
And so this presumably then is expressed through the feces of the bat. That's how it comes out of the bat and into the world. Yes, so all the studies that have looked at coronaviruses in bats, they've taken fecal samples, urine samples, and they've detected coronaviruses. That makes it incredibly easy for the virus to pass to other species, from wild animals to those that humans interact with and eat. Coming up. It's just a pot that's ready to boil over. Racing to stop the next global outbreak. This is really tied to the major environmental changes that are going on in the world. When W5 continues. The world's only flying mammal has a talent we humans could really use right now. Living with coronaviruses and being completely unaffected. Scientist Aaron J. Banerjee is hoping to unlock that secret in a lab in southern Ontario with the help of fieldwork by bat researcher Paul Ford. Tonight, Paul is getting ready to capture bats for his breeding colony at McMaster University. Blood and hair samples from bats in that colony will help fuel Aaron J.'s research. And of course, I'm here to tag along. We're here at a house just outside London, Ontario, because the homeowners say they've seen bats coming out right next to that chimney. Now, we want to see them too, but you can't rush bats. We have to wait for it to get darker. So right now, it's just a waiting game. So, Paul, why are we netting here? Oh, we've come to this particular location because I got a tip that there were bats uh, in this house, and we don't know for sure what species it is. It's probably big brown bats, but we're gonna catch a few tonight and just check it out. And if it is big browns, then you would use those maybe for future experiments? That's right, so we might uh, do some studies in the future. Right now, we don't wanna take them because it's during the breeding season, but in the fall or next spring, we might catch some pregnant females, that's right. Okay, so if they're coming out from the chimney and the net's down here, how are you gonna catch them? Well, the homeowner has told me that the bats tend to come across the roof line perpendicular to where we're gonna have our nets strung, so we should be in a good position to catch them. Makes sense, I mean, there's a pool, there's a forest, this would be perfect habitat for these bats I to go. I think so. Do you worry about COVID-19 from the bats here in Canada? I'm not worried about getting COVID-19 because we work with one species and we take standard precautions. We wear gloves in the field and we, we keep animals in quarantine before we introduce them to our other animals in the colony. Bats in residential areas are common all over the world. And as deforestation wipes out more and more of their natural habitats, we are bringing the bats and their viruses closer to us. What we are doing to the natural world, there's a clear relationship between that and these emerging pandemics from a zoonotic point of view. See, like, that's a good price. Carrie Bowman, bioethicist at the University of Toronto, has traveled around the world to examine ecological issues and how they affect us. He's raising the alarm about expecting even more pandemics and that we have only ourselves to blame. And this is really tied to the major environmental changes that are going on in the world. I've seen with bats in Africa, for example, with major deforestation, and, and I've seen it also in Asia, bats begin to move into more urban areas because they don't have uh, food supply anymore and they don't have the trees to roost in. And when bats are stressed, they're known to shed viruses even faster. Places of extremely high stress for animals are the so-called wet markets, and they're especially common in countries where food is hard to come by. Here, wildlife meat is often the only source of protein or income for people in rural communities. Some of these are likely migratory. Kerry has seen a lot of them, including China's Wuhan market, where the novel coronavirus was first reported. You were there before the pandemic started. Yeah. What was it like there? It was summer, it was very, very hot and you had cages, one packed on top of another, on top of another. They had very high pressured hoses to be blasting water around for cleaning purposes. This blast of water pushing um, blood, feces, urine, uh, from one cage, one enclosure into the other. I counted 57 species when I was there. So really a very, very worrisome picture 
from, from a crossover species point of view for zoonotic, meaning diseases that come from animals. So you were there thinking about the potential for a virus to come from animals to people. And you were at the market in Wuhan. So this, did this surprise you when this happened? Oh, enormously. And you know, my understanding was that after SARS, there really had been a lot of you know restructuring and a lot of rethinking related to this. Very little had changed since SARS. In 2003, SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, hit 26 countries. In Canada, more than 400 cases and 44 deaths were reported. What was the source? Likely a wild animal in China. But since then, research has dried up, so we may never know for sure. In 2004, a form of bird flu hit. Canada saw the first human case, with fears of its spread causing 19 million poultry in BC's Fraser Valley to be culled. 2009 saw swine flu. Estimates of up to half a million people died worldwide. This is a new virus that we haven't before described. The U.S. declared a national health emergency. And Mexico City, North America's most populous city, was shut down. It was the last pandemic before COVID-19. But COVID-19 isn't expected to be our last pandemic, not by a long shot. We actually do not have global infrastructure at this point to potentially deal with another outbreak. Even if every single market stops selling live animals, other major threats of spreading viruses from animals to people are increasing, like illegal wildlife trading across international borders, including Canadian ones. These are all from Canada's Wildlife Enforcement's evidence room. Sheldon Jordan is the Director General of Dealing with Illegal Wildlife Trading in Canada. This is a pangolin skin. The pangolin was a little known animal here in the West that came to the forefront at the beginning of the COVID pandemic because it was suggested that it was a host for coronavirus. Pangolins are the world's most trafficked mammals. Their scales are used in traditional Chinese medicine. The worldwide number of these and other smuggled animals, living and dead, isn't going down. It's doubled since 2015. When you're looking at illegal wildlife trade, it's worth something like 150 to 200 billion dollars US per year. Makes it the fourth most valuable crime area in the world. And what's being smuggled is of huge concern. Stuff that is being smuggled under the radar more exotic species or that come from deeper in ecosystems, in forests, in jungles, or more rare species where you might have disease and uh, there's no way of necessarily identifying that when it's uh, being put into trade. Yet there's no global oversight. While there is a United Nations agreement covering wildlife trafficking, it doesn't deal with health issues. And on the health side, the World Health Organization doesn't deal with wildlife. That's putting added stress on organizations not meant to deal with animals and disease. Our officers, they're not disease experts. If you go back to 2005 and there was the avian flu crisis, our officers, although they're normally doing enforcement, they were also tasked with looking for dead and dying birds out in the environment. They were also tasked with making sure that wild birds weren't coming into contact with the domesticated waterfowl. With about 75% of emerging human diseases coming from animals, global oversight of animal disease is key to human health. It's just a pot that's ready to boil over if you look at wildlife crime and how it can put us at risk. Back in London, Ontario, it's local bats we're focused on. They too can get viruses, so there's a lot we can learn about their coronavirus fighting immune systems. And the darker it gets, the closer we are to seeing what type of bats are living inside this roof. They should soon be flying out to feed, hunting for insects. When finally, a capture. So what kind is it? Big brown bat. Nice, beautiful.
And are they females? This is probably, I can't tell right away. So far we've caught only females, so I think we have a maternity colony of big brown bats in this residence. That's great. It is great. I love working at maternity colonies. They're sure loud. Yeah, she's giving off distress calls, but imagine if you were caught in a net and a big hand was grabbing you. After Paul's delicate handiwork of detangling this fragile creature from the net, Lickety -split, she's released. There she goes. Later this year, once her pups have left, Paul will return to bring a few of these bats back to his breeding colony. It's where these incredible big brown bats are helping to unlock the secrets for what could be a breakthrough in fighting COVID-19. That's what Aaron Jay hopes to accomplish. And the rare time he's outside of the lab, there's a reminder of why he's working so hard. There are some stones outside that I saw right after we first met, and uh, they have some messages on them. I honestly don't know who put them out there, but it did touch me a lot. You realize that people really value you, and what you're doing is not just a day's work, but it's going to change someone's life. Dan Riskin has traveled the world as a bat biologist. To learn more about some of his bat adventures, go to our website, w5.ctvnews.ca.